Uh, hello again, everybody. Thank you very much for coming back. For those of you who have come back, and for those of you your first time, you're very welcome. Uh, General Birds is a, is a bit of a rude uh, sort of <laughs> a bit of lumping uh, or clumping of, uh, of of this section. Um, when we started to look at habitats, we we decided that the for for, for the Chilterns, what you're mostly going to come across is the scrub, uh, is woodland, is open countryside. Um, but for many of us, the, there will also be a range of, of birds that will be seen all across the, uh, the three different specific habitats that we've, that we've talked about. And uh, Dave mentioned last week, he, he used the word JISS, J-I-S-S, -S, General Impression of Size and Shape, uh, which a lot of birders, if, you, if you're out with someone who's been birding quite a lot, they'll be able to glance at something and because they know where they are, because they know when they are, and because they know the types of birds that are likely to be there, they can make a very quick judgment. I mean, my wife is always, uh, I'll be driving down at 70 miles an hour and I go, oh, goldfinch. And she hasn't even seen the bird. And yet I've been able to see it out the corner of my eye, see a very small shape and a small bit of color and bang. Uh, and it looks as though I'm, I'm suddenly Harry Potter. Uh, but it's just the experience level that I've, that I've got that allows me to do that. But when it comes to bird song, uh, and when it comes to the likelihood of a given bird in a given place, uh, that's a whole different matter because obviously we all hear things differently. We all, we all have uh, different ways of remembering things as well. So the idea about tonight, and you know, the, the, the rule of thumb is that you remember about 20% of any given training or presentation. So the idea is that we can, uh, we, we give you these these uh, tools, uh, these PowerPoints that we've created, and you can go through at your leisure uh, and learn the bird song. Uh, uh, and there's nothing better than seeing the bird while it's singing. That's really important to uh, to keep uh, talking about that. If you can see the actual bird, sometimes it's more more easy than uh, said than done. Uh, it really will help you. So what we're going to be looking at tonight is the range of birds that will be found in all of the habitats that you're, you'll, you'll be looking in, as well as probably your gardens as well. For the most part, they're all common birds. Uh, they're common birds that you might see in your garden. I, I think during lockdown, I think out of the 22 birds that we're going to walk through, I think I've had 21 uh, in or over my garden. So it's uh, these, th some of these shouldn't become as a surprise to you, but maybe the calls and the songs that we're going to walk through, maybe they will uh, be a little bit of a surprise. So as you can see, there's going to be some, some quite easy ones here that probably everybody knows, but maybe they won't know some of the songs or the calls, or, or maybe you, you're, you're, you know it's a wood pigeon or a collared dove, and, and how can I actually tell them apart? So uh, because I've got the big shift uh, this week, the early uh, the early set of a lot of species. I'll be uh, I'll be trying to get through this uh, fairly quickly. As I said, ask me any questions. Stop me at any time if you need to hear something again. Um, hopefully, my sound is is hooked up to the laptop uh, at this time again, so you should be able to hear uh, the sound as though it was as as, as I hear it rather than coming through the uh, the speaker. So we're going to be looking at the tits. We're going to be looking at the finches. We're going to be looking at the sort of the house sparrow, dunnock, wren combination. I always like to lump them in. And then we're going to be looking at the thrushes, uh, and then sort of two members of the uh, of the pigeon dove family and two members of the corvids. Last week, for those who were here last week, um, they are completely all different birds from last week. So last week was uh, we covered the the scrub, which was all the warblers. Uh, and Dave sort of covered quite a few of the hirundines, the corvids, the sort of birds you'd see in open countryside. Uh, so Barry, I guess uh, when you get the, the downloads of the, uh, of, the, of the PowerPoint, step through them. If you need, if you need any help with anything, just give uh, Dave or myself a shout. Okay, right, so moving on. This should be, uh, as I say, hopefully for most of you, this, these, some of these should be very familiar. Um, what we have here is the great tit. Uh, the, <clears throat> the key thing around uh, starting any bird identification from call, from song, the great tit, although we're going to hear one of its song, is, is very much uh, can throw even the most expert of birders. So 
there is a rule of thumb that if you hear something singing, you can't identify it, it's probably a great tit, just because they do a bit of mimicry, uh, they're quite loud, and, uh, and, and they'll suddenly throw in a, a, a call that you, don't, you haven't heard before. Um, and that's not to say that you label everything that you hear that you don't identify as a great tit, uh, but with time, uh, even when they're singing, they're, they're pretty obvious. The key thing to remember about the great tit over the blue tit, that big white cheek patch, that big black uh, black belly stripe that they go down. Uh, the male and the female, uh, as you can see from the uh, uh, from the picture in the Collins Guide, the male has the big black stripe and the female has the uh, slightly thinner stripe. Um, what's quite uh, what's quite nice about their song, and this is the first thumbs up, hopefully that I'll be able to get from everybody, um, if we can hear the great tit sing. All okay. So it's quite a repetitive four or five notes. Okay, that's not to say that all the greats it will do, but um, that's the more familiar teacher, teacher, teacher. Type of call from the great tip and then what the great tip will actually do from a call perspective is it starts to very high pitched so we've got the song and then we've got that very high pitch Okay, so uh, sometimes uh, confused with uh, with the uh, with the great tit is obviously the blue tit. Um, uh, what what's what if you can remember from the previous one there that two 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 uh, the blue tit song is a little bit more sort of almost down up up down up up down up up. Not as symmetrical, not as rhythmic as the as the great tit, um, and the blue tit. Uh, there you go. And then the blue tit call. Okay. So a long series of. And again, you see, although the yellow is there, much thinner stripe down the uh, down the front. But hopefully, uh, you're all familiar with with great tits and blue tits. Um, from a sound perspective, uh, obviously, we, you, you, hopefully, a few of you will see long tail tits in your garden. Pretty unmistakable uh, in terms of uh, species when you when you see them flying, they just look like balls of fluff with this long tail sticking out of the back. Um, but what's interesting around the long-tailed uh, well, long tick call is that when you first hear something, you, you might hear that, that ch -ch 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 of, the, uh, of the great tit or that ch -ch 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 of, the, uh, of the blue tit, flying pom-poms, absolutely, Katie. I couldn't, I couldn't describe it better. Um, but when you, when you hear a long-tailed tit, and as a, the reason there's not the song and the call here is that their, their churring is, is pretty similar. Um, it's quite a high uh, metallic sort of sounding and once you get your earring on that and once you and and very often it's done in in parties as well so you'll have four five six long tail tips all giving that same high pitch And once, uh, once, as I say, once you get your ear in, once you see one of these birds, uh, do, they do this very often in the winter as well, for, uh, contact calls as they fly around. The fourth member, absolutely, squeaky wheelbarrow. <laughs> the fourth member of our, of our quadruples of, uh, of the more commoner tits that you're likely to see across, the, uh, across all habitats. Um, coal tits, obviously, particularly like pine woods, pine trees. Um, but you can see them in deciduous woodlands and you, obviously you, you get them in people's gardens as well. Um, to my ear, a very distinctive call, but I've been listening to them for 
36 years. Uh, so it's, uh, but for, for the first time people hear them, um, sometimes they're sort of, oh, what, what's that? But with time, you can differentiate them from the great hit and... Uh... Many times you're not going to be able to see these birds at all. They'll be at the top of a pine tree uh, or they'll be foraging in the... Uh, of the, uh, of the trees and you and all you'll be able to hit, see or hear rather is that is that song and they give a quite a distinctive call as well <laughs> again very high pitched very very much uh, the same sort of ill actually as the gold crest and we, we, we're not showing the gold crest as, uh, uh, as, as it uh, um, tonight, but a very similar if you're in that sort of woodland environment. Um, okay, the difference between a song and a call. Right, okay, so calls uh, tend to be contact, so keeping in contact with young birds or, or partners or, or other members of the flock. Um, just as just contact calls or I'm here uh, or stay away, that sort of thing. A song is a way to either hold a territory to to attract a mate so the idea behind what we're hearing here is these these will be male birds for the most part some female birds do sing as well but male birds for the most part advertising their wares uh look how great i am look how smart i look and oh by the way look at all my trees that i own um so it's really around showing how uh how much of a t how my territory and can I have someone to breed with? So very much that uh, that ability to attract a mate, uh, to keep other males away. So that's the difference between a, a song and a call. And Dave's just done what I've done in a minute and a half in uh, in two seconds. Thanks, Dave. Um, yeah, absolutely that. So when you see the song, so where I've, I've pulled out a song is you might hear a bird repeat this for five, 10, 15 minutes, whereas a call, you might only hear it once or twice. Um, and uh, yeah, absolutely. Contact call for contact and moosting. Right, so again, this is meant for you to be taken away, to use at your leisure. So I've just put all of the all of the, uh, the confusion species. As you say, the only ones to really confuse each other there are probably blue and great tit. And again, if it's got a black head, it's a great tit. If it's got a blue head, it's a blue tit. So. Uh, uh, just little snippets to, uh, to to take away from the uh, from the course tonight. Okay, so now we're moving into finches. So what we've got here is a chaffinch. Um, again, hopefully a common garden bird for a lot of you. Um, interesting to note some of the some of the finches will have uh, uh, sexual differences, male and female. We've got here male on the top, female at the bottom. Uh, but for some of the finches, uh, that's really difficult to, to tell apart. On the next finch, we're going to be looking at goldfinch. Uh, you can't tell males and females apart. Um, so the chaffinch normally delivered from in the middle of trees, the top of trees. Uh, and we're going to listen to the song first, i.e. the one that's it's, uh, declaring its, uh, its territory. <laughs> There was a jackdaw in the background there, but it's that chitty chi 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 chi. And um it's 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 normally delivered quite far apart as well. So you'll hear a chi 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 chi. And then there'll be three, four, five seconds. Chi 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 chi. Uh yeah, absolutely, Barry. Yeah, it does it does occasionally sound like a, a willow warbler. When you hear a willow warbler, it's got that sort of slightly descending trill to it. Um, but what you'll probably hear for the most part is a uh is the call so it's very similar the wheat calls we were listening to last time of the the chip chat it's very harsher and also if you can hear just in the middle bit here cheek they also deliver a, a sort of tink, tink, tink call as well, like a, like a coin hitting another coin. 
and again, fairly unmistakable when you do finally see them in a tree. Uh, in flight, they've got very obvious uh, white wing bars, uh, very obvious white outer tail feathers as well. So uh, uh, probably a bird you'll record on most of your uh, most of your uh, your visits, I would imagine. Very very common in in, in farmland as well. Um, the goldfinch, again, hopefully most of you will, will recognize the goldfinch. Uh, typically, any small finch flying over, uh, uh, again, this goes back to location, time of year, and likelihood of species. At the moment, uh, if you see a small finch flying over, your, your, your go-to search criteria is probably only going to be centered around goldfinch or linnet. Um, now, if you, it was in the middle of winter and you were, you were by a pine forest and you saw a little finch go over, you might have the opportunity of being a red pole or a, or a siskin. But the, 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 the thing to, to, to start to get your head around is what is likely to be in the location where I'm at at this time. Um, for the most part, goldfinches are, uh, are, are pretty ubiquitous. They're, they're found everywhere. Um, that brilliant gold on the wing uh, with the black. Um, but what you're more, more likely to hear before you see them is their twittering. Real fluty, melodic. Normally delivered uh, from the tops of the trees, but can also be in little song flights as well. And then when they start uh, flocking together, what you start to get is this lovely dangly, fairly similar to the song, but sort of a very Very obvious, gangly feeling. I think they're sort of like um, uh, having some coins in a, in, a, in a pocket or something and jangling them all together. The green finch, um, again, uh, jingle jangle, absolutely. Uh, green finch, uh, the most likely to be seen song flighting. So if you see a, if you see a finch, uh, like if we go back to the chaffinch, if you see if you see a finch undulating along a, a hedgerow, probably going to be a a, a chaffinch. Uh, if you see a smallish finch direct flight over with making a jingle jangle sound, that probably likely to be a goldfinch. And if you see a finch sitting right at the top of a tree and then bursting up into a uh, into a song flight, uh, again the the chances are it may well be a greenfinch. Now you'll have probably heard a couple of things before you see this anyway. You'll have heard the greenfinch song. And right in the middle of that is that wheeze. It's like a wheezy old you know, wheeze as it's coming out. Um, and it will do that, so it will do that quite a lot. Um, and it interspersed with that sort of little. And as I say, it will then suddenly launch out into a song flight, be really flap, 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 and it will come back to the same uh, same perch for the most part. As you can see there, the males are a little bit brighter, more yellow on the wing um, than the uh, than the females. Uh, and again, obviously, use your time to to uh, if you do if you are lucky enough to hear that wheezy jingle, then uh, take the time to find the green finch. You'll probably be sitting right at the top of the tree and just get your, your eye in on the actual sound. Um, and then lastly, in the finch family, again, almost unmistakable uh, if you see this. What you tend to see uh, as it bombs down the hedgerow away from you is its white rump. Um, both the males and the females show a big white rump, black, dark tail, and um, but what you might happen before that is very rounded wings as well so you'll see these bound away from you um if you're lucky enough they do uh, if they land on the hedge you'll you'll see this big black head and on the males this amazing red front um but what you might hear before that point is the uh real 
real sort of horn sounding. Um, uh, some of the northern birds, when we get them down here, uh, we sort of like to talk about these little trumpets. Um, and I think that, that horn sound is quite apt. So uh, you'll hear them just in, in the middle of uh, uh, really like old hedgerows, and you'll just hear that. <laughs> uh, Nick's, uh, Nick, Nick's the man for the, uh, <laughs> for the uh, uh, analogies tonight there on the chat. You're absolutely right. Old rusty pub. Real, yeah, you know. And when you hear them in real life, uh, it's really quite direct, quite penetrating. They make the same call in flight as well. Um, I was out walking down there at Oak Hill Wood in York Beans last week and I suddenly heard, meow, meow, meow. And there was, a, there was a bullfinch just flying around uh, above my head. Fantastic view. So there we have it. You've got the male and the female chaffinch, the goldfinch, which you can't, uh, can't separate um, except in the hand. And then you've got the male and female greenfinch and then the male and female bullfinch. And absolutely that, that white rump, which you can see just about peeking out there on the... Uh, uh, at the bottom of the, uh, the the female bullfinch there. Yeah, really good. So that square white lump. That's pretty much all you see, to be honest. Okay, so moving forward. Again, uh, any questions you want, um, I'll probably shut my window down because I keep asking the questions and then Nick and uh, Dave go and answer them in, in person. So I'll stop looking at the questions now. Um, so <clears throat> we're next, uh, we're going on to uh, song thrush. So the next four species, or next three species, I think uh, a lot of people have uh, probably the most uh, trying times with, uh, because we're looking at the song thrush, the blackbird, and the missile thrush. And some people are, well, how, what's the best way to tell them apart? So the key thing around the differences between song thrush and missile thrush, and we'll see them a little bit better on the next page, Song thrush very much buff down the down the flanks, and what we're talking about the flanks there is the side of the uh, of the belly. And although you can, although it's very spotted, you can see the spots almost merge into one another. Very brown on the back, very uh, sort of warm brown, and then you've got that sort of buff around the uh, around the face with that uh, uh, with that little black bill, and then those uh, sort of orangey legs. Um, Song thrushes are the ones that have to go for the snails as well. Now, the key thing around learning the songs, again, it's fantastic if you can actually see these birds singing, but for the most part, um, the song thrush. <laughs> repeated phrases. See how it repeats the phrases. Very melodic. It goes up in pitch, but always repeats the phrases. And if we go on to missile thrush next, what you'll what you'll what, what I always find for missile thrush, and you can see there on the uh, on the Collins guide, uh, the missile thrush is is bigger. It stands more upright, it stands taller. Um, the brown is a different brown. And those spots on the belly are clearly rounded spots. Um, has white on its outer tail um, feathers, if you can see on the, on the diagram as there. White corners as it flies away. Um, but the key thing about missile thrush, and, I, and uh, uh, quite a few people have said this, is just all, no matter where it is, it always sounds far away. It's quite a melodic. Doesn't really repeat phrases. Very fluty. But again, even though you're standing underneath them, they still sound quite quiet. The song thrush belts out its song, um, whereas the missile thrush very much uh, more subdued. Uh, and then what, what tends to happen is if the missile thrush is disturbed, if it's, uh, if it's moved around a little bit, you're very likely to hear this. Like a rattle. 
does it typically in, in perks when it's a bit agitated and especially in, uh, in flight as well. Like a, uh, like a footballer's um, uh, rattle. Uh, fantastic sound. I was sitting in a, uh, in a churchyard looking for spotted fly catches the other day and there was a two missile thrush just uh, chattering away uh, above me like that. So yeah, fantastic, uh, fantastic bird. But again, just try and uh, keep playing the songs, get out there in the field and, uh, and just sort of try and learn the subtleties between the song thrush and the missile thrush. Um, so moving on, and we're talking about the blackbird now. So this is the only species really of the of the three thrushes that we're looking at that you can actually tell the males and females apart. Again, should be fairly familiar, but just to start to listen to the actual song. And the thing that I find about blackbirds is that they very melodic, probably the most melodic actually of all of the uh, of all of the thrushes to my ear. See, there's no repeating, there's no uh, constant flow of melody. Uh, very loud if you're standing underneath them, um, but more often you'll probably be associated with of the blackbird alarm call there. So again, it's that melodic sound um, often delivered from uh, uh, rooftops, uh, perched on rooftops or, or very high uh, high trees in, uh, in, in the wood. Uh, often the earliest bird to start singing as well as part of the dawn chorus. Uh, the first one is uh, uh, robin and blackbirds typically. Um, so moving on to the starling. Uh, again, a fairly familiar bird, but what we've just started to see literally in the last week or so is that young bird there down on the bottom left hand side of the screen that you can see. And then we've got a male bird in resplendent and it's uh, in its incredible uh, green, purple, black plumage with those bright red legs. Um, starlings are amazing mimics. They, uh, their song is just made up of shattering and high level chatters uh, if you're ever in your garden and you've heard of curlew you probably haven't it's probably a starling doing an person or an oyster catcher or they can be very mimic they can, they can mimic um, car alarms uh, house alarms uh, fantastic bird if you can uh, watch one thing in the whole the whole net shape and uh, uh, with the uh, with the effort uh, of singing and then you've got the calls uh, it's hopefully all the bird bees in the garden especially the young ones being out and about now with that urgent chattering okay so again Take the time, have a little look at, uh, at uh, why, why the differences are there, that, that soft warm brown of the song thrush versus the, the darker, colder brown of the missile thrush uh, and that sort of buff sides uh, with very fine streaking of the spots whereas individual spots of the, uh, of the missile thrush there. Okay, right, so moving swiftly on. Um, I'm, I'm not monitoring the uh, chat, by the way, so if, if, if anyone does, uh, Nick, if you're okay, brilliant, that's uh, cool, we'll, uh, we'll carry on. Um, okay, the ubiquitous dunnock. Um, again, very common. Uh, if, uh, if, you, if you fancy a, a good read, just Google the dunnock, the life of a dunnock. Uh, it's, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's an incredible read. It, uh, it, um, it mates many times, has many partners, and, uh, and often fights to the death with its love rivals. So uh, uh, a fantastic little species. Um, it used to be called the hedge sparrow as well, so you can see um, why, it, uh, why it got that name. It's not actually part of the, the sparrows at all, it's part of the Accenter family. Um, if anyone's been to the Alps and seen Alpine Accenter, it's the same family as that. But typically, if you come across these guys uh, and you see a little uh, bird shuffling away, sort of uh, grey brown, it's likely it's going to be a dunnock. They do a lot of hopping on the ground as well. Um, 
I always struggles the wrong word, but I always I always have to stop and think when I hear a Dunnock song because if you can remember from last week, you've got the white throat, you've got the black cap. The Dunnock is that very scratchy element as well. Very quick to stop. Pause. So it's really quite scratchy, quite, um, uh, but very short lived, very short burst. And it's fantastic watching one there, they're a fantastic burst to watch. This is the Dunnock Call. Very much a pinch, 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 pinch. Very, very, um, very fast, quite an agitated uh, sounding call. Uh, but again, really scratchy, but. Uh, uh, typically, they sing from uh, top of sheds or or within uh, within uh, sort of uh, trees in the garden uh, and along hedgerows and that as well. So that's the Dunnock. Um, the wonderful Wren. Now, most of you have probably heard of Wren, we, maybe even, even without realising it. These are the explosive singers. Size for size, the decibel of the uh, of the wren is just incredible. And if you're ever lucky enough to see one delivering that song, it just it ripples with with uh, effort. Um, one of the smallest birds, I think, only small, uh, only uh, seconded to the uh, gold crest uh, because of its uh, size of its tail. Often more heard than than seen. But when it is seen, that, that distinctive jerky tail. Um, but when they're actually calling, really quite an agitated, a bit more agitated than the tonic. But still, they'll stop that agitation and they'll burst into that explosive. The robin. Hopefully, I don't have to explain to anyone the uh, the uh, the identification features of the robin, little robin redbreast. Although you'll start to see the young birds uh, are starting to emerge at the moment as soon. They look and, and act exactly like robins, but they've got that brown thing. Now, okay, sometimes people get mistaken with song thrush and blackbird with a robin, but the unique quality around the robin. Very melodic, but it's very quiet. It's very. It's almost having a conversation with you. It's not like that that belt out of the of the blackbird. It's just very delicate, very very measured. And again, these are the ones that you can hear sometimes singing throughout the night. And then they're cool again. That sort of high pitch, titty, titty, titty. not as again, not as urgent as the uh, as the wren or, or the donut. And then we've got the fantastic house sparrow, and I've put tree sparrow in brackets here because uh, although we're uh, we're not probably expecting you to find many tree sparrows, uh, and we didn't really include them in the uh, in the any of the other ones, it's uh, it's just useful to to, to know that if you're out and you do see a sparrow with a wholly brown head, um, check it out for a tree sparrow and have that little dark spot on the side of the neck. Uh, but a house sparrow is the one that we're looking at here. Uh, and for most people, this is probably lucky enough to live in a house sparrow colony. It wakes you up at 4.30 in the morning. Cheat, 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 cheat. Normally delivered from guttering or boxes of houses or very deep hawthorn um, hedgerows. Uh, another good, uh, another good nested place for house sparrows. So again, you've got the dunnock, the house sparrow, the robin, and the wren. These are these are typically the birds that you'll see appear perch up on the top of the bush. And as you can see, they've all got a unique stance. Even though some of them have got slightly cocked tails, the wren is the uh, is the most uh, cocked tail, uh, and uh, but 
what typically happens if you are in an area full of house sparrows or you find yourself on a, on a tetrad that's got a house sparrow, you'll be, uh, uh, you'll be, oh, what's that? What's that? Oh, it's a house sparrow. What's that? What's that? Oh, it's a house sparrow. They can, they can pretty much get anywhere. Um, when I'm, even when I'm birding around lakes, I'm like, oh, what's this flying into the reed bed? It's a house sparrow. So uh, they are fantastic. I love them. I've got a colony near my, uh, at the bottom of my uh, garden uh, of about sort of 30 or 40 breeding pairs. So it's, uh, it is fantastic. It does wake me up at 4.30 in the morning. Though. Okay, so moving on. And now we've got the wood pigeon. Um, so we're, I'm just going to be talking about wood pigeon and collared dove. And Dave's going to be talking about stock dove in his woodland section. Um, uh, again, wood pigeon, they appear in most people's garden. They're one of the commonest uh, occurring individuals within a garden setting. Um, and obviously big, black, purpley sheen gray and then in flight they've got those big white wing bars and that big white clump around the uh, the side of the neck and then that white over the bill is is quite obvious on that gray head with that big glaring yellow eye as well um but what you might recognize the most for is their song if the house sparrows don't wake you up the wood pigeons do the way I like is a and then what you'll occasionally hear as well, and it's it's quite it's quite quiet on this one. You have to listen try, right towards the end of the, of the recording. Is the wood pigeon display flight? So it'll it'll start calling while it's uh, while it's flying, and then right at the last minute, it goes clap 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 with its wings. <laughs> and it'll come down and it'll sort of it'll, it'll parachute back down to uh, back down to earth and carry on flying the collared dove 1953 was the first breeding pair in norfolk and now pretty much uh, you can't uh, you can't go anywhere without seeing uh, the uh, well, it was also used to be called the um it was a ring-necked dove as well when it's a ring-necked pigeon uh, i think when it first uh, first turned up as well from that black ring around its uh, thing um it's not really got white wing bars it's just got pale areas uh, uh um on the uh, on the secondaries and uh coupled with that dark uh set of primaries um what the collar dove tends to do is it tends to have a, a particularly unique flight call it also flies up and does some clapping um but its song is fairly similar uh, to the wood pigeon but again what i urge you to do is is try and find a, a hoo in wood pigeon or a hoo hoo collar dove and see if you can start to learn <laughs> In my mind, it's much more harsh, much more. And if you remember the wood pigeon was. I like it a bit of a sped up wood pigeon, I, uh, I like to think of the collar dove. So you've got the wood pigeon and the collar dove that we just talked about there, and then stock dove, which Dave's going to go into a little bit more detail on, and the uh, fantastic feral pigeon or flying rat, depending on your viewpoint uh, of these things, but uh, uh, originated from the rock doves, of, uh, uh, which now still are in northern Scotland on the, uh, on the, uh, in the Orkneys and Shetland. Um, as you can see, although they superficially look like each other, um, when you uh, when you actually see them in flight or or, or hear them calling, you'll you'll, you'll appreciate um, the much subtle differences. And obviously, as uh, as Nick said, this is this is no um, uh, replacement for getting out there and, and getting your getting your hands dirty. And obviously, what we love is if you if you come across anything you don't identify, just taking a photograph of it and chucking it up on our WhatsApp group. So moving swiftly forward, the magpie. Um, again, the, uh, a very obvious bird of open farmland, of, of, um, uh, of gardens, and what you're more likely to hear, especially in, uh, in, uh, in, in woodlands or where you can't actually see, is you'll suddenly hear this, and to my mind it just sounds like it's laughing at us. <laughs> Almost like a snigger. <laughs> <laughs> chur, chur, chur. Um, and again, it normally delivers that with its tail quivering 
um, and uh, normally while chasing another magpie around. Um, the thing that people get confused with, not necessarily visually, because the jay is an incredible looking bird, the only thing that gets confused with a jay is normally a hoopoo, um, but the uh, the jay, if people sort of suddenly in woodlands, they go, oh, is that, is that a, a, a magpie or a jay? Well, if you remember the, remember the magpie call, let me just get there, and when you start to hear the jay call, Much more of a squawk, almost like parrot-like in its uh, less ch -ch 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 more squawk-like. I always, I always find to my ear they're a lot harsher than the uh, than the magpie. So not really confusion of species in terms of visual effects, but certainly if you're in a woodland and you can hear someone calling. Try and see if you can get a cha 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 or that squawk squawk. Okay, nearly time for the break. You'll all be pleased to know, so you can go and refill those beers. Um, so if you remember from last week, or if you didn't, there are there are another couple of Hirondines, uh, Swallow and um, uh, and San Martin. Uh, I haven't included Swift this week because. Uh, uh, it's not actually officially a here and dying, but it's uh, uh, typically you're, you you won't see it as low as some of these uh, some of these birds. The house martin nests under eaves on uh, on, on houses. Uh, quite often seen collecting mud from within the road. That really blue sheen on the back. Everyone thinks that the house martins are, are blue completely up on the top. As you can see, their their wings, their their primaries there are actually a sort of a, a, a dull brown, but when you when that light glints off that blue back of the house martin it's really quite obvious and that white rump white rump short forked tail um you can see there as i'll show the next screen in a minute which shows you the uh, uh the comparison of them all but um you've got clear white throat blue on the back white rump shallow tail uh, that's your house martin and what do they sound like just muttering muttering to themselves. It's almost like they're twittering away. A little bit less melodic to my ears than Swallow, if you can remember the fun from last week, and when you get the two the two files to compare the Swallow, but the, the house mind just seems to be a lot more chattering to my mind. And there you go, when you see them in flight, you're that big, pale underneath house martin, really short tail. Um, even though you can't see the, the white rump, you can still see that real sort of capped appearance. The swallow, a uh, completely dark throat with that, with that off-white sort of buffish underneath and that really long uh, tail with those pale translucent uh, tail feathers on the middle and then lastly the sand martin which if you're one of your transects is near a, a quarry or um, over some water then uh, with a, with a riverbank um, uh, chances are you might be able to see a sand martin as well um, so with that uh, we'd like to say thanks for the uh, for the Collins uh, <laughs> eBird guide. We uh, we took some screenshots and downloaded that. We urge all of you, if you don't own a copy, if you're able to, if you're, it's about eighteen pounds, I think, um, to get a, a, a copy on your phone. Um, uh, it also has a range of of bird calls, as you can see here. So, for instance, if I was to look up wren, um, you'll see there's the uh, there's the picture of the wren there. I can go into it. Um, and I can actually select the song. And if I knew how to work a smartphone, that'd be even better and press the wrong button. Um, and you can hear there, it's actually the, uh, the song of the wren. It gives you the alarm call that we, we heard earlier. So um, I'm under no commission for the, uh, for the Collins eBird guide, but um, it's on my phone. I've also got two copies of the book as well. Um, I, for some unknown reason, I keep both in the car, but uh, I guess just in case I meet another friendly bird who hasn't got one and wants to read it. Um, uh, and obviously a lot of the pictures that we, uh, we borrowed from, from Google. Uh, so we do have to say thank you to all of those photographs, uh, photographers out there.
Uh, any questions that uh, I may have missed? Uh, hopefully my, my two more than able um, friends and compadres hopefully answered everything. Um, so if you're all back in the room, that'll be fantastic. So swapping from, from general birds to, to woodland birds, and I guess a lot of your transect or your survey squares will, will take in a bit of Chilton woodland, and if not, definitely walks in the Chilton's definitely will take you to woodland. So it's an important... Um, group of birds to pick up on. So Dave, if you're happy to walk us through uh, the woodland section, that would be fantastic. Yeah, no problem. No problem. Do you see, this, see the screen okay? Okay, brilliant. Well, what a difference a week makes. So um, last week we were talking about birds in scrub and the... Oh. I've done it again, haven't I? Can you hear me? I can now, uh, sorry, I tried to mute everybody, I literally <laughs> muted everybody, sorry. <laughs> That's all right, don't worry. I was just saying, this, this, this time last week we, we went through scrubland birds because of the, um, the, the warblers singing and making sure that everybody had a chance to go out and, and hear them, so hopefully you did because for the first time in probably two months I went out today and, and couldn't hear a black cat. Um, all I heard was, was chiff chaff, so things are starting to, to stop mm -hmm. singing now. Um, so uh, yeah, we're definitely uh, getting into that stage where we're going to hear some some interesting calls coming in. Uh, we've got um, I'm trying to get my screen to respond. Here we go. Okay, good, good. Um, so yeah, so we're going to coming into a point where we're going to add some some interesting calls to the ones that we're going through um, on the presentation tonight because we're going to have some some young birds coming out um, as well. Um, but I'm going to focus on woodland and um, with woodland we're talking about mixed broadleaf, conifer, beech, plantations of various sorts, copses, um, game covers, uh, all that sort of thing. And um, some of the examples there, Burnham beaches, uh, Wendover woods, Penn woods in the Chilterns areas and then we've got some sort of brick hills, little Linford woods and, uh, and plenty of others north of the Scarp Slope none of which I'm that familiar with, but Simon can probably fill us in uh, on, a, on a quick message if we need to. Um, but there's plenty of woodland and um, obviously plenty of birds in there. Uh, here's an example of some sort of beach type habitat. And um, we're obviously going to be uh, um, spending a lot of time in this, um, looking for some of the birds. Before we get onto the species, just to sort of give you some, some clues in terms of um, actually birding in, in woodland, um, especially if you are surveying, it's very much the 80-20 rule here that um, the ears to the fore, um, you will hear so much more than you will see, especially now that um, the leaf cover um, is well out on, on beach, beach woods and most of the other woodlands. Um, any chestnut woodlands and that sort of area that, that there's just very difficult to see things um, particularly um, and you will hear much more than, than you will see. So slowly does it, just um, take your time walking through the woods, listen all the time and just scan around, look at the trunks, see if you can see any holes in the trunks and if so have a look at the holes because um, often at this stage if it's woodpeckers or nut hatches or jackdaws or whatever it happens to be, the young could be sticking out their heads out of the holes, um, waiting for the adults to return with some food. Um, and that'll give you a good clue as to whether there's any sort of uh, breeding birds in, in the vicinity. Um, not so much singing going on, um, lots of calls potentially, some of which will be unfamiliar because they are um, young birds. Um, and obviously the thing to do is looking at the, the adults um, flashing backwards and forwards. I mean, they're going to be carrying food. So you can see food in the beaks and flight. Uh, and if they're just coming out of a nest somewhere, then they'll be carrying sort of little white fecal sacs and that they're going to be dropping somewhere away from the nest. Listen for the, the, the begging calls. That'll help you potentially to, to, to home in on where a nest might be. Uh, and then you can potentially see the adults coming in and, and feeding them and you'll be able to identify the species um, associated with that, uh, with that nest. Um, so this is the list from last week. Uh, the ones with the ticks are the ones we covered last week. 
and uh, here we are the ones in the in yellow that we're going to cover um, tonight so uh, we should be finished um, hopefully well before the, the half past eight deadline um, so I'm done a good job on, on getting through his his list very quickly um, so Simon touched on uh, wood pigeon and he showed a picture of a, a stock dove and um, one of the uh, the, the species that um, is, is can be quite sort of um, it can be quite difficult to see at some stages other times it's very obvious it's not nearly as obvious as a wood pigeon um, it can sit in the trees often nests in in dead trunks um, and can be quite obvious but other times it can be it can be quite um, quite quiet and uh, um, not not be seen but so what you will do is is hear it potentially more often but what you have to be aware of is that the song is is quite quiet um, it's very different from the wood pigeon song i've got them both here and we'll play them but with the stock dove um, you will not see any white on the bird at all uh, things to look for um, are the, 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 the nice um, colour on the side of the neck um, and on the front of the neck where it's, it's definitely much more sort of deeper, deeper sort of purpley colour, not purpley, but yeah, purpley colour. And on the wings, there is no white whatsoever, but we will see some, some black patches here uh, on the ends of some of the, uh, the coverts, uh, the greater coverts than the, uh, the, the median coverts. As I say, it tends to sit in the uh, in some of the trees, and you'll hear the song, uh, which you'll hear now. Can you all hear that? Yep. Okay, that's great because I can't hear it at all at the moment for some reason. So this is going to be interesting. Um, I can hear it now, so I'll change the configuration. So it's very much this very different from the, the wood pigeon, which I'll play now, which you've already heard. There's many more notes to it. Quite, the stock dove it can be quite subdued, so you have to. You sometimes have to listen quite carefully to uh, to hear it. But it is um, uh, is a very a smart dove, um, and if you see it and it comes out and it starts displaying, it's very very angular, almost sort of cuckoo like in the way that it can it can pull up its tail up into the air uh, and bend down and and then display to a uh, to a female that it's trying to attract. Uh, a nice a nice bird. Um, on to um, obviously bird of the woodlands, the uh, the woodpeckers. We're going to start with the the green woodpecker. Um, now you're probably all quite familiar with this bird. Um, Simon put out a, an interesting photograph of one on the uh, <laughs> the tracking uh, tracking with, um, group earlier. Um, see it in woodlands. Obviously, you'll hear it probably more often than you'll see it. You can also get them um, on the ground, in the, in the open ground, where they might be looking for ants, either to eat the ants or to actually use the ants um, to put them over their feathers to, uh, to help them clean themselves um, as the ants go after the bugs in the feathers and, and use, their, uh, use their acid to, uh, to attack the, uh, the various bugs. Um, so you have the, uh, the, the adult, which is the, the, the picture uh, in the middle here. Um, I actually took this in, in the garden a couple of months ago. Um, now you can see that it's not that obvious, but there is a, there is a red centre to the whisker um, in the, uh, underneath the eye there. So that indicates that it is a, a, a male bird. The female doesn't have that. Uh, and then increasingly over the next, um, next few weeks, next few days, few weeks, you'll increasingly be seeing the bird on the left, which is the, uh, the very scaly juvenile bird which already has its, um, um, black, uh, has its red uh, crown 
and also has some uh, some red in the the moustache if it's a male or not if it's a female. Um, very familiar call on its own, almost laughing like, taking, taking the mickey. The classic, classic sound of the uh, of the woodland, and then we have the the drumming. So just uh, just in coming, we get a bit late in the season for a lot of drumming, but um, um, when it comes round to sort of February next year, and you remember that you've got these presentations, um, you'll be able to compare the uh, the drumming between the uh, the green woodpecker and the uh, the great spotted woodpecker. It's almost like it starts off really, really deep and meaningful. It's giving giving the, the, the branch or the trunk a really good push, but then it just sort of just sort of gets fed up with drumming and, and this sort of fades away um, in, into nothing. So it just sort of starts strongly and finishes off quite uh, quite weak. Now to the great spotted woodpecker. Um, very different in terms of, of plumage. Um, obviously, the uh, the red uh, at the back on the, the the bird on the left hand side indicates that it's a, a male. Um, if it's a female, there would be be no red there; it would be all, all black. And interestingly, when you get the uh, the young birds, then uh, they have the red on the on the forecrown. Obviously, the the one of the key things if you see them flying through um, the canopy. Um, lots of white on the on the upper wing with this uh, this area here uh, and the big red undertail coverts which make them um, pretty uh, pretty unmistakable. So to play you the call, very very different from the green woodpecker's laugh. You can hear in the background actually there's some some young begging calls going on from the great spotted woodpecker nest. That's the uh, the call and then the drumming. The smaller bird and the green woodpecker, it's, it's, it's a stronger, stronger drum that goes on and it, and it, it, it dies away much more quickly, so it starts off strongly and carries on strongly and then dies away more quickly, uh, to my mind, than, than the green woodpecker. Uh, and bear in mind that this is a bird that's probably um, two thirds the size of, of, the, uh, of, of the green woodpecker. Now on to a couple of my, uh, my favourite species that um, you can encounter in woodland. Um, and you, you'd find these in coniferous woodland and or sort of mixed woodland with some sort of conifers or firs involved. And the great, great thing about these is that um, goldcrests have been around in the county for uh, forever and um, are quite common. You can encounter them um, pretty much anywhere you go. But the great news is for the, the bird on the right, um, which is one of the, the best, uh, best looking British birds that you can see, is that um, these are really uh, increasing in numbers um, throughout um, Buckinghamshire, um, coming in from the south and, and then filtering north. Um, in the Chilterns uh, area, um, there's been lots and lots of records this spring, many more than, than, than previous years. So the chances of encountering one of these um, fabulous birds is, is pretty good. Um, now you can see on the left hand side the gold crest it looks looks relatively plain um, although the wing pattern is, is quite um, quite complex um, it's got this it's very it's got this very sorrowful look so you've got the, the beak and then coming out either side of the beak you've got this this little thin black line that, that, that runs down that gives it a, a, a very sort of sorrowful sorrowful look and, and with the beady eye in, in the sort of the plain face uh, sort of accentuates that. But if you see one singing uh, and uh, a male singing, then the yellow crown here, um, then that gets separated um, as per the, uh, the, the firecrest on the right here. And you just get this glorious orange 
display of orange feathers um, as, as the bird is singing to a, to a female. The firecrest is, is something special. Um, it's just, uh, there's, uh, to me, there's something about it. It's just, um, it's, you know, these, two, these are the two smallest British birds. Simon mentioned the wren as being the, the, the other one. Uh, well, these are slightly smaller. Look at that face pattern. I mean, what's not to like about that? Little bandit face um, covered with, you know, orange feathers when it's displaying and singing to a female. And then you've got these gorgeous coppery shoulders here, um, which the, the gold crest doesn't have. Um, and it is just, it's just an amazing, amazing bird. But they're both lovely, um, both tiny, both very, um, uh, very tame at times and, and will allow sort of um, close approach by you or they'll actually come closer to you quite often especially in winter when they're uh, they're hunting around for uh, uh, for food so we're just going to go through the uh, the songs and the calls um, they are sort of similar but different um, this is the gold crest song quite thin ends in a nice sort of little flourish. It starts, come, starts going up in the start and then there's a little flourish down, down at the, the end there. Where's the fire crest? It starts off, it accelerates and then it stops. And it's all sort of very, very sort of the same level uh, in terms of uh, the note itself. So quite similar, but, but in fact quite, quite different. So it doesn't have that flourish at the end, but even all the way through apart from the acceleration in, in terms of speed and then, and then stopping. So certainly something to, uh, to listen to a few times Try and get out there and um, see if you can hear um, both species. As I say, we, uh, we're both uh, we're both in, in good numbers, um, certainly in the children's area this year. Uh, comes the uh, the gold crest call. That's a blue tit. That's a more hen. That's a blue tit again. Very, very high pitched, very thin. If you're over a certain age, you might have trouble hearing it. Fortunately, I can still hear them at the moment. It is quite a, quite a thin, high pitched call. And then the firecrest call. Sounds quite different in terms of the number of notes in that and the length of time it's calling, but they don't always necessarily call quite as long as that, and they can they can be very similar to a gold crest. So <clears throat> if you get a if you get a crest in a tree, um, look at it hard because it might it might not look like anything. You might think it's just a gold crest, but it might just be the fact that it's the light, uh, because they tend to to favour some of the areas where the light is not so bright. Um, but so have a really good look because you don't want to overlook a fire crest um, if you're doing your uh, if you're doing your, your woodland walks. They are just uh, such fantastic. Birds. So there's a comparison of two uh, two birds in the hand there on the left hand side, fire crest on the left and the the gold crest on the the right. As you can see, the uh, the difference we've got the uh, it's just uh, looks. Looks amazing, but it can be it can be very difficult to see sometimes in in, in the poor light. Uh, and there on the, the right hand side at the top, uh, the gold crest looking towards you. You can see that sort of bit I mentioned before in terms of the, the little black lines coming down and the, uh, the sort of the sorrowful look. Um, both of them will uh, when they're feeding um, in in furs and so on, they will often hover. Uh, in front of the leaves in the same same way that a, a chiff chaff or a willow warbler can do. Um, so look out for that. Um, it's a, a telltale sign that um, you've got something uh, 
something interesting to uh, to look at. Um, on to Simon's favourite bird of the year. <laughs> <laughs> um, this is the spotted flycatcher. Um, it's a very late arrival, tends to arrive sort of um, beginning of May. Um, does pair up um, very quickly um, in its sort of favoured area and, and, go and go quiet very quickly um, as it starts to, uh, to, to build nests and, and, and mate and, and rear young. Um, but there's still a chance that you could, um, you could get out there and certainly see one, um, if not hear one over the, over the course of the next week or so. Um, Hewenden Park, um, there's about, uh, there's at least three pairs um, there this year. I've um, seen a couple of them myself, fortunately. Um, but they, they, again, they can be very obvious, um, especially in, in autumn when the young are around. Um, but um, if they're sitting out on the end of a branch, fly catching early in the morning or late in the evening, uh, it's probably the best time to try and see them. But uh, the rest of the day, they can be they can be hidden in cover, and uh, it doesn't help that their their song um, is not the strongest. Again, hopefully everybody's young enough that they can hear it, but it's certainly not uh, it's not a powerful song, so best not to go looking for them on a windy day. And unfortunately, the call is not that much stronger either. You just hear it in the background there. Best time to, to really see them is probably from um, late June onwards when the young uh, are starting to, uh, to fledge. Uh, and then they'll, they'll be much more obvious in terms of sitting out on exposed perches, um, catching flies and so on. Um, again, it's, a, it's, a, it's one of these birds where the, the southern edge of the range appears to be moving north. Um, common in, in the north of um, England and, and Scotland, um, becoming rarer now in, in the, the, the southern part of uh, England. Um, so it'd be great if you can, if you can find some of these um, birds um, used to be such a such a common bird nesting in everybody's garden, but um, unfortunately not the case down here now. So Simon um, did uh, four of the uh, the tit family. Here's the uh, the fifth one, uh, which you'll find exclusively pretty much in in um, woodland. Certainly during the breeding season, you do find them occasionally in gardens in uh, in the winter. Um, depending on the severity of the weather uh, and the availability of food. Um, again, very different from um, the other four. Um, quite a plain looking bird. I mean, the only sort of real confusion species would be, uh, would be willow tit, which unfortunately is, is now no longer a breeding bird in, um, in Buckinghamshire. So if you're in a woodland and you get a, a small brown tit with a, a white cheek and, a, and a, a black bib like this and a black cap, um, then it's almost certainly going to be a, a marsh tit. Here's the song. Pretty simple. five or six notes, all on the same level. Seems to be a feature of woodland birds. We've all got songs on the same level. And this is the one that you're more likely to hear, which is the, uh, the call. Blue tit-ish blue tit like there, um, but um, it is sufficiently different that um, you know once you hear it, um, you'll think, "What the? What's that?" And uh, you'll go off and you find yourself a, a, a nice marsh tit. So here we are. Amazing how we've got the same photographs as oh, sorry as Simon. 
<laughs> um, but you can see, you know, if you look at the head of a, a, of a tip, then you know, it's, you've got the answer. You don't have to look anywhere else to, uh, to see which species it is. Um, they're, all, they're all very obvious. Um, nuthatch, um, this is a really um, pretty much a common bird now at the moment in terms of woodland and some parkland areas. Uh, very difficult to miss this if you're going for a, for a walk through any woodland at all, uh, certainly in terms of, of hearing it and you'll quite often hear the uh, call. really can be that loud if not louder uh, when you hear it. Um, here's the song. And this, this does carry for a long way through a, through a wood. But if you get to know it then it'll save you tromping miles to go and find out what's the source of the call um, or the song. Notice this is the bird that um, climbs up trees and it also climbs down trees as well. Very adept at climbing down um, something which um, the next species, tree creeper, doesn't do. Tree creeper will creep up um, the side of a trunk of a tree, get up to a certain height and then it'll fly and it'll fly down to the base of the next tree that it wants to feed on and then it'll walk uh, and climb up that looking for um, um, spiders, insects and, and so on as it does that, that it will fly down to the next, uh, the bottom of the next tree and that it's feeding on. Sometimes it will walk all the way up to uh, up to the top. The nut hatch, you'll see it on trunks, you'll see it on branches and it will say it will be going along, it can be going up, it can be going down um, in any direction. So that's pretty much the only, only uh, if you see one of these, um, you're not going to mistake it for a nut hatch anyway, um, because of the cryptic plumage on the back uh, and the pale under pale underparts uh, and that uh, that lovely little curved beak um, that it has, um, enabling it to probe into the into the bark for uh, for insects and so on. Very um, unassuming. Um, you know, it, it's easy to uh, to overlook them. Um, but it's, it helps if you uh, get familiar with the, uh, the song and the uh, call. Quite high, quite sort of piercing in, in some ways, um, but It's not one of those. It's not one of those songs for me that sort of grabs you and says, "Listen to me, I'm, I'm a tree creeper." It's, it's, it can be. It's one of those things that if you're out and there's other lots of other noise as well, you can you can be overlooked um, fairly easily. So tune yourselves in into that uh, before you go out. And the call quite high. In the sort of level to uh, the gold crest, potentially longer. Um, yeah, less specific to my mind. A lovely bird to see, and if you can find a nest that's, that's hidden behind a, a crack in a piece of bark and so on, then. You, they are amazing things to watch. I think there was um, a pair on them, um, but they've got a nest, a nest cam on in, on Spin Rock. Um, so we're going to have a look at that uh, and uh, have a look at the nest. So come to the last couple. Um, perfect timing if, if you might. Well, these are through these two in um, just um, in case there was time just in case you're lucky enough to, uh, to, to stumble across either of these two um, birds on your, on your walks. More likely to hear them than, than see them, although little owl can be uh, um, crepuscular in terms of coming out at dawn and dusk, so you might see it a bit more than, than tawny owl. I just thought I'd play you the, uh, the calls. 
just so you can think that if you, you do hear something, think that doesn't sound quite like a tawny owl, um, then you might get the you, you might be able to identify it as a as a little owl, which would again would be a great record to uh, to get. Quite different from so this is the little owl calling. It's quite different from the tawny. You should probably all be familiar with the uh, the tawny owl call, but it still sounds quite owl-like. And then onto the uh, the song. Tawny out first. And then little owl. So, so uh, there are some some similarities in in, in the sound. It, to my mind, it's a little bit higher. Um, tends to go on for a, a little bit longer potentially. Um, but um, you know, if you get to, if you get your phones out and get the chance and record the song and then come back and, and play it, and then you'll be, uh, you'll be able to uh, identify them fairly very easily. So that's the uh, that's the species. Um, just coming up to half eight, Nick. So uh, back over to you.